Okay, in that case, um, hi to everybody. Welcome to tonight's meeting. Um, you know, once again, I hope everybody is managing along in our still lockdown situation. But, um, you know, vaccines or no vaccines, well, maybe soon, maybe soon we can get actually out and about and meet once more. Um, tonight's guest speaker I'm delighted to introduce is Matteo Cataneo, who is at the Royal Observatory in Edinburgh. Um, Matteo has been there for, he tells me, four years in a postdoc um, post, um, but is about to leave this summer. Um, um, he did his PhD work in Copenhagen, which would have been really lovely. Um, also, his home is in Italy. So tonight's talk has the very intriguing title of Cosmic Dissonance, A Tale of Two Universes. And although the field of cosmology has had, well, possibly more than its share of hotly disputed topics, um, Matteo is going to tell us about the latest issue, which he describes as having reached nearly crisis point. So that sounds exciting. It is always reported that to give up a long cherished theory um, is a very difficult and not necessarily pleasant thing to do. So I'm looking forward to him telling us about the exciting issue which is current in cosmology. So I will hand you back to um, our speaker for tonight and to David who will see if we're set up to go. Can he, David? You're on Sorry, mute. I muted myself. Yeah, it's all running uh, fine. So, Matteo, you can just uh, okay, fire sure. up the presentation and carry on. Okay. So, hopefully, you can see this all right. Perfect. Okay. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, everyone. And thank you, David and June, for having me and for the nice introduction. Um, Maybe before diving into the, the presentation, the talk and the stories, actually the two stories I want to tell you about, uh, I'll say a little bit about myself, about my research. So I'm uh, a cosmologist uh, and uh, I'm neither uh, an observer nor a theoretician. So I'm kind of in, in, in between, I'm a phenomenologist. So what I do is uh, try to make up some uh, models that can explain what we observe in the universe and then I try to test them against real world data uh, to see if these theories um, can hold up or if they have to be ruled out. Uh, and I've done that uh, during my PhD using uh, massive galaxy clusters, so clusters of galaxy groups of galaxies, and uh, I'm doing this now in, in Edinburgh in the group of Professor Catherine Heyman's uh, using uh, a, um, an observable, a, a quantity called cosmic shear. So we look at, uh, I'll tell you a bit more about this later during the talk, but we look at the shape of the galaxies or faraway galaxies. And this shape can tell us about how matter in the universe is distributed spatially and how structure grow um, throughout time. So, and this will change depending on the content of the universe and on the theory of gravity. So by looking at these quantities, we can tell if, for example, Einstein's general relativity is right or wrong on the largest scales in the universe. So this is what I do, uh, but who knows if I can do this for long or just, you know, I have to change my job uh, into something different because this talk would be about a story um, that starts about, I think, a century ago now, so in 1920s, where cosmology was born. And uh, as cosmologists, hopefully you can, okay. As cosmologists, we like arguing a lot. So from these arguments, these squabbles, actually, we can make progress. And that's how science works. Um, there are the most important ones, these grand debates usually 
uh, bring with them some paradigm shifts. So uh, our view of the cosmos of the world changes dramatically once we resolve these grand debates in this uh, controversies. Um, and uh, I like to think about these grand debates as a, a boxing sparring match, uh, where the uh, arena is science and uh, the boxing ring is really the, um, the place where people um, usually meet and discuss. So it could be like university, scientific papers, conferences and workshops. Uh, and the referees here are really the scientific methods and experiments. And so we will have two opponents uh, or group of opponents uh, and a well-placed blow by one of these opponents really is a verifiable prediction. So if these people have a theory and they have a well-defined prediction that can be tested experimentally, this is a very well-placed uh, blow. Um, of course, you win uh, by uh, looking at the results of the experiment as it's uh, verified your prediction, you go on, okay? So the first real match uh, was in the really 1920. And uh, the question that uh, these two gentlemen asked, Harold Shapley and uh, Herbert Curtis, two American scientists, American astronomers, was, are spiral nebulae in our galaxy? And this question can be rephrased in a, in a different way. And uh, we could ask ourselves, how big is the universe really, right? So back in the 1800s, uh, basically people, astronomers could see this, this blobs in the sky, this very diffuse fuzzy thingy. Uh, and they didn't know really, they thought that they were part of our Milky Way. So our galaxy was everything that was, that ever was. Um, but these people in particular, uh, Heber Curtis thought, no, not really. At least some of these objects that we observe and we see are actually outside our galaxy. So, and that implies, so this is what they were called, or this guy called island universes, okay? So now this is a well-posed question, right? So we want to know how big is the universe and simply what we need to do is to measure the distance of these objects from us once we know how big the galaxy is. And Shapley knew and also Curtis knew how big the galaxy is. Okay, so if we measure the distance from these objects and the distance is much larger than the galaxy, we of course know that these objects are outside our galaxy and the universe is much bigger than we thought. All right, so it just happened that there was a person uh, at the Harvard College uh, Observatory in the 19, early 1910s, uh, in particular 1912 there, uh, this, this lady, Henrietta Swan-Levitt, was employed at the Harvard College Observatory as a human computer. So she was literally a person doing calculations. So at the time, women was not, were not really allowed to go on in their studies, okay? So the best thing they could do and the closest they could get to do some science was really doing computational things. Uh, and also I would say men were thinking that women couldn't do that, but Henrietta von Levitt proved them wrong. And how did she do that? Well, she was tasked uh, at, um, cataloging, basically listing uh, stars that were observed in you know, photographic plates. Uh, she had to list them in, based on their brightness. And so um, how many of them and how bright they were. And she noticed something, something, some pattern that other people couldn't really see. And that was uh, thanks to the fact that she was really close to the data, right? She noticed that some stars, uh, these stars were called uh, Cepheids, and we'll see throughout the story that these stars are really important uh, in cosmology. These Cepheid stars basically were changing their luminosity uh, periodically. Uh, and that was known, so nothing weird there. The weird thing is the fact that the more luminous, the brighter the Cepheids, the longer the period. 
okay? So she, you can see this from this, uh, hopefully you can see the cursor here. Can you nod or, yes, perfect. <laughs> Uh, from this graph here, this plot that was, it, it, I've taken this from uh, uh, Henrietta's uh, paper. She was plotting the luminosity on the y-axis of the star as a function of the period of the, um, of the Cepheid's pulsation. And uh, she noticed that the maximum and the minimum of this brightness were like related to each other through a linear relation. So you can also, you know, just draw a line for the mean luminosity of these stars. Um, so this tells us something, it means that if we know and look at a star, a sifted stars, and we look at the period, we can measure it wherever it is, we know its luminosity. And that's really important because if we calibrate them using another method, for example, a trigonometric parallax or a geometric method, we can naturally triangulate the position of these stars. For some of them, then we can definitely say geometrically how distant they are from us. We calibrate that luminosity, period luminosity relation. Then if we find a CFID somewhere else, for example, in one of these nebulae, then we know how far it is. And uh, Edwin Abel in 1925 knew about the period luminosity relation and just conveniently found a Cepheids in the Andromeda Nebula. At the time it was a nebula. And uh, he did this uh, measurement and of course he found that the nebula <laughs> was 2.5 million light years away from Mars. Of course it's much much bigger than our Milky Way. And so Ever Curtis won this match. So we, for one, understood that the universe is much, much larger than what we thought. The second grand debate also shook the uh, foundation of cosmology, okay? So cosmology was just born like seven years before, seven years earlier. In 1927, there was another question that uh, people were asking. So is the universe stationary or expanding? So here to the right, we have a person, a scientist that everyone knows. He's a giant of physics and cosmology, Albert Einstein. To the left, we have uh, Georges Lemaitre. So he was a Belgian clergyman and physicist. The two things sometimes don't go well together, but for him, it worked very well. And uh, <clears throat> Georges Lemaitre uh, understood general relativity, Einstein's theory, very well. And uh, he came up with um, a solution to his equations, the famous um, general um, Einstein's equations of uh, space and time that would encompass the entire universe. And uh, a solution to these equations showed that actually the universe shouldn't be like stationary or static, but should evolve in time. How would it evolve? Like he, sh he showed that the universe should either expand or contract. All right, perfect. Uh, Einstein looked at his work, they even met, and uh, he had something to say about his work. He said, your calculations are correct, but your physics is atrocious. So if someone like Einstein, right, a giant tells you that, the only thing you want to do, you know, is like going to your home and just, you know, cuddle and do nothing else. You don't want to do anything else. It's, your self-esteem just goes down the drain. But George Lemaitre was not like that, so he pushed, he kept going. Um, and uh, thanks God he did, because again, Edwin Hubble in 1929, using the period luminosity relation from Henrietta Leavitt, was able to look, uh, to, to get these data. So again, from Edwin Hubble's paper, what he did was measuring the distance of some Cepheids stars in uh, galaxies other than our own. And he plot them on the right, on the x-axis. And on the y-axis, he took the velocities of these galaxies. And the velocity is, is easy to measure because if we look at how light is redshifted or stretched or blue shifted or compressed, we know what is the speed of this galaxy along the line of sight. 
okay? So this is the easy part. The, the hard part is the x-axis, so how far they are. Now, he used the uh, period luminosity relation and he plots these data points, distance and velocity. And he noticed something. He noticed that the farther the galaxy, uh, the faster the galaxy was receding from us. So it was going away from us. Uh, so, and in fact, he found a linear relation that you can see here, where the velocity is proportional to the distance of the galaxy. And this constant of proportionality is what we call now the Hubble constant. And uh, we call it H naught. We, not every time we don't say the Hubble constant, but it's H naught. And this law, this linear relation is what we call today the hubble lemaitre law. So you might guess now that Lemaitre was actually right. So it's no really mean feat to beat Einstein in, on his ground, really. So it was a very remarkable achievement what Lemaitre did. And Einstein had to concede because to make his universe sta stationary, what he had to do is to add a term to his equations, the famous cosmological constant. And he regretted that for all his life. He's, he called it the, his biggest blunder, all right? So that's the big mistake that Einstein did and was Lemaitre that pointed it out. All right, so we have a universe now. It's big and it's expanding, all right? Now we jump forward to the 1950s. Another big question, another big debate. Uh, you can now see that the number of people is increasing. So cosmology is really becoming a thing now. <laughs> so the, the question was like, is the universe starting from something or it's always been there? And uh, the question was like, is the universe a steady state universe or we have a big bang universe? And the first party here to the left uh, is a group of people from Europe, uh, America, uh, even Russia, Yakov Zeldovich. And they had their calculation, they, they had their model, the Big Bang model, that uh, started from something that Georges Lemaitre called primeval atom. And that was expanding and all the, the basic, the elementary um, uh, nuclei and, uh, and particles we know were born. Um, and the, after that, um, there were some predictions, right? There was a prediction, a very important prediction from the Big Bang Theory was this relic or fossil radiation coming from the infant universe, okay? Uh, this fossil radiation was never measured uh, in the 1950s, until the 1950s, but had, they had this prediction. So it's a very clear thing you can test. On the other hand, the steady state universe had on the side a philosophical, if you want, metaphysical argument by saying the universe doesn't have to be born from anything. It's always been there and it will always be there. But you have to pay a price for that. And the price is you have to create continuously matter from nothing, okay, continuously. So the universe keeps expanding, of course, but things are coming out of the, from the vacuum, just from nothing. And, uh, you know, uh, these two theories, these two models of the universe were on the same ground at the time. But, of course, the Big Bang Theory had a prediction. So, can we test this prediction? And the answer is yes. How do we test that? Well, it just happened really by chance. It was just a serendipitous discovery what happened. Um, so Arnio Penzias and Robert Wilson were two radio engineers at Bell Laboratories in, in New Jersey. And uh, what they wanted to do was to build a very, very sensitive, ultra-sensitive cryogenic microwave receiver. So it's just uh, an antenna. And you can see the antenna here in the background. It's a horn antenna. Uh, and they wanted to use, to the, uh, what they want used it for um, uh, satellite communication and for radio astronomy. That's all they wanted to do. Perfect. They built it. And then, of course, there is a, a, a test phase, right, where you check that everything is working fine. And what they found was like some strange hiss 
like a noise that would never go away. So they initially thought, well, we are not too far from New York. There must be some disturbance, radio interference from New York. But they moved the antenna. They wait for the night and day to go. So nothing changed, nothing changed. So it was not like a preferred specific direction this is was coming from. It was coming from all, all over the place. Then they thought, okay, there must be something with the receiver, with the antenna itself. And they did find something, some droppings from birds and bats. Uh, so they thought, okay, look, if we clean the antenna, for sure now this is will go away. They went to their receiver, they look at the data, and the his was still there. And at that point, they started scratching their heads, like, okay, we don't really know what's going on. Uh, but there were rumors that a group of scientists, of physicists in, at Princeton was working on something uh, related to the Big Bang Theory. Uh, and these people predicted that from the infant universe, we should see a fossil radiation. And the temperature of these radiations, they measured to be around five degrees above absolute zero. So very, very cold. And this should be uniform all across the sky. So they talked to these people in Princeton, and one of them was Bob Dickey. And they said, look, I think you found something. I think you found something big, just by chance. And in fact, what they measured really was the cosmic microwave background radiation at three Kelvin. So this is three degrees Celsius above absolute zero. Um, and this is the first data point in this plot. So this shows um, the, if you want, the brightness of the power of this radiation as a function of frequency of this radiation. So the first data point is here, and it can be nicely fitted. It's just one point, of course. So you can, be, uh, you can fit this with a, a black body radiation curve. This is a very well-defined physical model, okay? Uh, of course, the people in Princeton were working on the same receiver, but they got scooped. <laughs> so uh, Pensons and Wilson arrived first, uh, but thanks goodness, they were almost done and their receiver worked at a different frequency. So that means that you could test this theory on a different frequency. And in fact, they put another data point and it fit fitted perfectly the three degree black body spectrum. And that was really the uh, smoking gun for the uh, CMB and uh, gave really the trophy to the Big Bang Theory group. Okay, so uh, I should remark one thing, Fred Oy, which is one of the, uh, he actually was the first proponent of the steady state theory. He never conceded this <laughs> until the end. So he always thought that the steady state universe was the correct model, even in face of the data. All right. So I'd say every good match needs an interlude and it needs a break. So the first break is uh, dark matter, okay? So now we have a model of the universe by the 1960s, uh, end of 1960s, that we have a big universe is expanding and actually at a beginning, all right? So we can place even a, a beginning to this universe and can explain a number of things. One thing that was not explained by the 1960s was some observations that were already available in the 1930s. So Fritz Zwicky, brilliant physicist and cosmologist uh, that spent most of his career at the Caltech Institute um, of Technology, uh, the California Institute of Technology, sorry. Um, so he had this, uh, he looked at one of the um, closest and biggest clusters of galaxies, uh, closest to us, the coma cluster. And he did uh, a relatively simple calculation. So he had always a uh, brilliant idea, sometimes controversial. People most of the time didn't take him seriously, but it was most of the time right. And uh, people realized that after 30, 50 years, okay? So he had this huge, fantastic intuition. So what it is like, I look at the coma cluster uh, I look at the stars, I try to sum add up all together the mass of these stars. And I also look at the motion of the galaxies 
within these clusters. So the motion of the galaxies is linked very tightly to the mass of this object or the mass of the cluster. And what you notice is that if I do the, cal the calculation using the velocities, uh, how fast the galaxies move in the cluster, and then look at how many stars this, galaxy, this cluster has, the two don't match. There is something weird going on. So we came up with an idea, again, controversial uh, at the time, that there was some matter that we couldn't see, it was dark. It's called dunkel matter. So it's uh, materia was the time. So it's dark matter. So this, this matter is, is, you don't see it. It doesn't interact with light. So you can only see it through gravi gravitational effects. And people dismiss the idea. <laughs> it doesn't matter. Uh, now, 40 years later, I mean, 40 years later, <laughs> you have to wait 40, 50 years for that. Vera Rubin, an American astronomer, was looking at some of the data she took uh, about the rotation, rotational curve. So you look at the spiral galaxies, and as a function of distance from the center of the galaxy, you look at how stars and the gas within this galaxy is, is uh, orbiting, how fast is doing that. So the expectation, of course, is, um, look, I see the stars. I know how much gas there is. So if I apply Newton's law, I should expect this sort of prediction, this sort of curve. Then she look at the data, and she sees actually that this rotation curve, they flatten. So the farther you go, instead of going down, like in a solar system, right? So Mercury is orbiting faster than Neptune. So that's what you expect. But actually what's happening is that when you go further and further, this thing is orbiting at the same speed. And that's weird. And of course the explanation <laughs> for that was the dunkle materie. So it was the dark matter that Zwicky predicted 40 years earlier. So the two, uh, th these two different observations could explain uh, the same phenomenon, okay? You just needed one thing. You had to trade some weird dark matter that you never observed for the explanation of this data. And people are, up to today, up to this day, they're still uncomfortable with the idea of dark matter, okay? Okay, so now we have, in this um, universe, we have normal matter, the stuff that make us, like me, you, your desk, your chair, everything that actually we can see, the stars, galaxy, everything. This is normal matter, ordinary matter. And we also add to the recipe dark matter, a lot of it. And you need like a ratio of five to one dark matter over ordinary matter. So it's, it's a big, big fraction of the matter, of the content of the universe. And now we go to the 80s and 90s. Um, and we have two, uh, again, two big scientists here, Alan Sandage, uh, which was, who, this, this guy was uh, uh, Hubble's designated scientific heir. So Hubble was a very big and important cosmology and astronomers. And he said, look, Alan, you will be my successor. So he was very, very important and influential in the cosmology community. And then we have Gérard de Vacuder. He was uh, also an important astronomer I would say, I would start saying not as, as big as Alan Sandage, but important as well. So people listen to him. And there was this debate between the two. Is the Hubble constant low or high? So one, Alan Sandage said, the Hubble constant is 50 kilometers per second per megaparsec, which means if I have an object at one megaparsec, and megaparsec is a distance, uh, a, a unit of distance from us. Uh, this object is receding away from us at a speed of 50 kilometers per second. And Girard de Vacular said, actually, no, I think it's 100 kilometers per second per megaparsec. And we would say, okay, it's a factor of two difference, it's a big difference, but why does it matter? Why the value of this single number matters to us? And that matters because the Hubble constant is really related to the age of the universe and to 
the scale of the universe. So distances and the scale of objects in the universe are directly a consequence of the Hubble constant. Okay, so it's really important for cosmologists to know this value. Now, again, the question is well posed. So what we can do is go out there and do the same thing that Edwin Hubble did, but better. And that's what Wendy Friedman and collaborators did in 2001 using the Hubble Space Telescope, okay? So they started this, uh, the Hubble's key project. And what they wanted to do is to measure the Hubble constant H0 with a precision of 10%. It was the goal of the project. And what they did was, again, they measured the period luminosity relation from Cepheids in distant galaxies from us. They plotted it, but now they did much, much better. So they had much smaller errors, uncertainties on these objects. And what they found just fall right in the middle between the 50 and 100, right in the middle. So it's 75 plus minus eight kilometers per second per megapulse, all right? So very, very diplomatic and democratic, just in the middle. So none of them won. At this, this time, none of them won, all right. So we have a very important parameter now that describes the universe, the Hubble constant, and we know it by the late 1990s, well, early 1990s with a precision of uh, 10%. Another important parameter that Alan Sandage set out to, um, to measure and said, this is really important in, in, for, for cosmology. So there are two numbers like the Hubble constant and the other is the deceleration parameter. Yes, because you know if we have a universe that is stuffed with ordinary matter and a lot of dark matter and it's expanding, you know, due to gravity, this thing will pull on each other. So what happens is that as it expands and there is a pull, it starts to slow down. So you expect this thing to expand and slower and slower and slower and to slow down. What it does exactly depends on the global geometry of the universe and that's something else. So you, you can think that the universe can be flat or curved in a particular way. But what you expect, again, that if you have some matter in it, you expect it to slow down on the expansion. And so he wanted to measure the deceleration parameter, it's called. Um, now, what will I tell you, what I will tell you in the, in the next five minutes or so is something completely surprising. People were really, they weren't expecting that. Uh, they were shocked. Cosmology was really shocked. Um, so the first thing that you need to understand is how we uh, can go further than the Cepheid star. Because cepheids are, yes, luminous, but after a certain distance, we cannot see them. It, it's too hard. Uh, so what we need is something else, some other object, a very bright object that goes far, far away. And in this way, we can measure how the expansion of the universe has been evolving throughout the, um, the history of the universe. And one such object is supernova 1A. Okay, these are really, really big explosion. And um, in this video, it shows what a supernova one is. It's basically, we have, we start with two stars, two companions that orbit each other. One companion is, uh, has a solar mass below uh, 10 solar masses. As a, it's a mass below 10, 10 solar masses. Uh, at the end of its life, it just, you know, uh, remains only a core the core of the stars that made of carbon and oxygen. So it, it stays there. It doesn't collapse anymore because of quantum properties. So there is this electron pressure degeneracy. So you have the, the, the core that wants to collapse, but due to some quantum properties, it cannot. So it stays there. And nothing would happen uh, if it was alone. But there is a companion and this companion is evolving and the envelope of this star is also growing at some point. When it exits the main sequence, it evolves and the envelope is growing. So it starts to get into the gravitational influence of the white dwarf, that is a white dwarf. 
and uh, the white dwarf steals material from the envelope. And gradually it accretes material. And at some point, when it reaches a very precise mass limit, 1.44 solar masses, the electron pressure degeneracy that holds the core, the white dwarfs together, just breaks down. It cannot hold anymore. And there is a runaway reaction that collapses everything and explodes, okay? And release all the energy that was stored there. This is a huge amount of energy that is released. And in fact, it's so big that it's comparable to the nucleus, to the bulge of the whole galaxy. So you can see here that where is the arrow? There is a supernova. So if you ask where is the supernova, it's where the arrow is always. Uh, and you'll see here that the supernova 1A um, goes off and uh, its brightness is comparable to the center of the galaxy. That's how bright it is, which means we can use it as a standard candle. Standard candle is what a Cepheid star is as well. So if we know the luminosity of an object and we see this object at different distances from us, by knowing the luminosity using this relation, because the flux is what we measure, our telescopes and our eyes get the flux, we know the luminosity, then the flux goes down as the square of the distance of the object. So we can invert this relation, we can get the distance, we measure the flux and we know the luminosity, right? So we have a standard candle. Now, it turns out that supernova 1A are not so standard. So if they explode, they have a range of luminosities. In particular, if you look at the peak, the peak has various kinds of luminosity. But some smart people realize that the peak of the supernova explosion correlates very well with the uh, fading time of, uh, of the explosion. So the brighter the explosion, the longer it takes to fade away. And they found an empirical relation so that corrects the, these light curves. So it means that the light curve is a, um, a, a plot where you show the brightness of the object as a function of time. It corrects this light curve. And you can see here that you can standardize these stars. Uh, so now they have pretty much the same peak brightness. And we can use that as a standard candle. Now, a group of two teams of cosmologies in the late 1980s, early 90s, set out to um, measure this deceleration parameter that Alan Sandage was talking about. And these two groups are the uh, Supernova Cosmology Projects and the High Z Supernova Search Team. One was led by Brian Schmidt and uh, Adam Rees, and the other by Saul Permuter. And uh, what it is like, again, using supernovae as distance indicators. And they basically recreated, again, the uh, Hubble's diagram, but using supernovae this time. So now you have redshift here, which is, again, how light gets stretched on the x-axis. And on the y-axis is the apparent magnitude of the supernovae, okay? how bright it is. Uh, when we see it. And they plotted these points. So these are all supernovae. Uh, the smaller the redshift, the closer to our supernovae. And then at some point, uh, they went far enough and they noticed something really, really unexpected. They noticed that the supernovae were farther from us, was fainter from, uh, than, than expected. That means that they were farther than we thought. So there was something that happened in between when they went off and us, and that's something they realized uh, is the universe has been accelerating its expansion. So they set out to measure the deceleration and they found acceleration, all right? And this team are com were completely independent. Uh, so, and that's a good thing. So you want to double check and triple check that things are correct because this is a very, very big discovery. And in fact, they confirmed that the universe is accelerating. They put a placeholder for the 
substance that is creating that acceleration. They call it the dark energy. And yet again, we have another dark component of the universe. This time, the dark component is in huge amount. So it's a 70% of the universe. So we now have a universe that is made of 70% dark energy. No idea what it is. We have 25% dark matter. No idea what it is. And then us is 5%. So we have 95% of the universe that is dark. We only say that it's there because we see the gravitational influence it has on the evolution of the universe. And these three guys went on and were awarded the Nobel Prize in 2011. So this thing was a really uh, big hit. All right, so we have, now we, you see we are creating this model in cosmology throughout the years. We are now in the um, 2001, early 2000s. And I showed you one way to measure the Hubble constant, H0, basically using distance indicators and building up what we call a cosmic distance ladder. So we start from trigonometric parallax, so geometric, very, very solid measurements. We calibrate the period luminosity relation of Cepheid stars with that. And then we use Cepheids to calibrate supernovae. Okay, so we have this at each rung, we have an object that can tell us how distance is this object from us. And of course, if each rung has of this ladder has an uncertainty, this uncertainty will pro propagate up the ladder. All right, so we really want to know each of these rung very, very well. But we can do also another thing. We can actually use, I'll show you now, the cosmic microwave background radiation to measure, to tell us what H0 is. So this is like going from one end of the universe, from us outward, and from the, we, the CMB inward. And hopefully what you try, what, what, what you really hope, if your model and your theory of the universe is correct, these two things will merge and match, okay? This is what we want, perfect. Um, just to recap a little bit, what um, Pences and Wilson measured with their horn antenna was something like this. So what they saw was a uniform three Kelvin background radiation from all over the sky. Now, this is what we would see. So basically it's uh, it just false color. Of course, it's in microwave, but I just colored it in green. Uh, you have here the galactic plane. So just uh, emission from the galaxy. So it, once you remove it, it will just be uniform green. And we know that this temperature is around three Kelvin. So three degrees Celsius above absolute zero. So how on earth do we go from this that is just uniform to this? That is galaxies and stars and it's so different from place to place. How do we do that? And we have to go through this. <laughs> and basically what we do is the concept, the idea is we start from something that is very uniform and we break that uniformity by giving to some and take from other, all right? So we create some um, inhomogeneity in that uniform background. So this is actually a picture of the cosmic microwave background. And the fact that we didn't see that before and it was uniform is because this differences, these bright and dark spots are very, very tiny in temperature. So it's just one part over 100,000. So it's at 0.001% of the temperature of the CMB. So these are the kind of fluctuation that you see here. Uh, now, what are these actually? So I won't go into the details of what seeded these fluctuations, okay? You can ask me later if you want. But let's start with this. So we have something that created this um, inhomogeneity in, uh, in the early universe. Now, the early universe uh, was a very different place compared to what we have nowadays. So if we go back in time, right? Uh, using Georges Lemaitre idea of the Big Bang Theory, if you rewind the history of the universe, 
So now it's expanding. Of course, if you go back in time, it will, it will be compressed, right? It will be just shrinking and shrinking and shrinking. And if you compress something, you are increasing the temperature of this something. So the same thing goes for, of course, the CMB. So it starts, we observe it, we see it at three Kelvin, but if you go back in time, the temperature of the CMB radiation will start increasing, increasing, increasing. At some point, the universe will be so hot that the matter we know is not in the same form. So we have atoms, but they are ionized. So we have protons and we have electrons that float around. We have photons, so light, particles of light. And if electrons and protons can free floating around and move and uh, zap around the universe with photons, they will interact through electromagnetic radiation. Okay, the electromagnetic interaction. So you will have photons that scatter off electrons and they are coupled together in a dense. So they never leave each other, okay? It's a plasma, that's what it is. It's a ionized plasma. That's what the universe was like, it was much, much simpler than galaxies and clusters of galaxies and stars, a very simple place. Now, one interesting thing that happens is that if you try, oh, and in all this, of course there was dark matter, but dark matter doesn't interact with light or doesn't interact with radiation. So it stays there. So if uh, a photon will just go through, right? They do not see each other. So now imagine uh, there is a, a lot of dark matter in some place. This will uh, of course cause some gravitational pull. So we'll try to pull matter like ordinary matter. But ordinary matter is, is dancing with photons. They don't leave each other, remember? So if you try to squash and compress radiation, it will make, it will be hotter and hotter and the radiation will try to escape. So there will be a pressure. It's called radiation pressure. So at some point you compress it and it goes down, but the pressure is too much. So it just bounces back. And of course, at some point the pressure will go down and then the gravity wins. So it's a battle between gravity and pressure. And so what happens is that you have oscillations and oscillations in the plasma, you have sounds. So you have sound waves, all right? So one of the thing that this maps of the universe tells us is that we should see sound waves. So it was one prediction of the Big Bang Theory. Jim Peebles and collaborators and uh, Rashid Sunyaev and collaborators independently, one in the US and the other in Russia, came up with uh, this idea. So we should see sound waves. It's like a musical instrument, right? So there's, uh, there's some fundamental tone and we have the overtones. So the universe is a musical instrument in the, in the early, early times. And uh, as for a musical instrument, if some of you are musicians, you can measure the sound spectrum of an instrument, right? So the quality of the sound is given by the notes that you see, the fundamental and the overtones. And they sit down and did the calculations uh, and they show that uh, the sound spectrum of the infant universe should sound something like this, right? So there is a fundamental tone and the overtones, the harmonics. This is the first time that the CMB power spectrum was calculated. Now, fast forward to 1992. Uh, people now were convinced that they should see these fluctuations in the CMB. They just needed the right instrument. So they put in orbit a satellite called COBE. COBE uh, measured the CMB radiation it measured to very, very high accuracy the temperature of the CMB at, that, at many different frequencies. So it confirmed absolutely that the CMB radiation is a black body spectrum, but overshadowed by that, uh, that discovery by another discovery. So it found those fluctuations. This is a low resolution version of the map of the CMB. So this is the first map of the primordial fluctuations, we call them. You see there are bright 
and dark spots. And these are the fluctuations I was talking to you about before. And uh, Sunyad and Peebles predicted that this fluctuation had to be one over 100,000 um, with, with respect to the background temperature of the, of the CME. So these are the kind of fluctuation we're talking about. And why is that? Because that's the kind of fluctuation we need to get the structures we see today, like the galaxy clusters and galaxies. So they reversed that calculation and said, okay, I need the CNV temporal fluctuation to be 10 to the minus five. And that's exactly what Kobe measured with fluctuation at 10 to the minus five. So this was a triumph of the Big Bang theory. All right, so we were very, very sure the Big Bang theory is the correct model of the universe. And 10 years uh, later, uh, still NASA, sends another satellite and said, look, now I want really to focus on these fluctuations. I want to understand better uh, how the sound spectrum of the CMBs work. If I, we can predict it, let's test it. And this is the medium definition, medium resolution map or mid five version of the CMB fluctuation by the WMAP satellite. As you can see, the difference is astonishing. <laughs> This is 10 year of technology, right? Okay, and there it is. So WMAP first data release in 2003 measured the sound spectrum of the universe. If you're wondering what does the universe sound like when in these early stages, that's something like this. Hopefully you can hear it. Uh, just tell me if you can. <laughs> that's the... Cosmic Symphony, probably very <laughs> unpalatable to most of you. Uh, certainly not a Beethoven, not a Mozart, but that's the right music we needed to get the structures we see today, to get the galaxies we see today and to get planet Earth, so life, all right? So this is the right music for us, even though we don't like it. And uh, one thing that you notice in this, um, in this uh, prediction, you see, these are, the data are in black, okay? And the predictions are in red, and they are very good predictions, all right? Very good predictions. And uh, we can see the fundamental tone and the overtones as well. So in the first data release, we could only see two of them very clearly. The third one was there, but was not clear. I show you what we, can, what we can do today, like uh, 10 years after that, you will be amazed. So why does this matter for the Hubble Council? Well, uh, we have this, you know, the sound spectrum. Uh, we measure this in terms of, we call them multiple moments, but you can think in terms of angular scales. So this is the size of the aperture angle we, we have on the sky. So we start from small angles to large angles. And we can see that there is a preferred angular scales on the CMB fluctuation spectrum, and it's about one degree. So we can measure this very, very well. So let's say this number, the triangular size of the fundamental tone, is known very well. Now, what can we do with it? Well, if we have a physical model, we can predict how far the first sound wave could propagate, knowing the sound speed of the sound wave, uh, after 380,000 years old, after you know, the Big Bang. And that's the time when basically protons and electrons could combine together because the temperature of the universe was cool enough. And at that point, photons didn't have a partner to dance with, so they could free stream away. So they could just go away. And that's the radiation we see. It basically, we see a frozen picture of the universe 380,000 years after the Big Bang. Perfect. So the first and fundamental sound wave could propagate for 380,000 years. And that's the fundamental tone. We have a model that can predict the size, the physical size of this sound wave. And then, we have a model as well, it's the same model, of course, that predicts what is the distance from us to the CMB, all right? And the ratio of these two, very easy, tells us what is the angular size of the fundamental tone. Now, 
if we combine this with the relative heights of the overtones, we can, in a very complex way, extract the value of the Hubble constant. So the Hubble constant, assuming some particular model, is imprinted on the CMB fluctuations. Good. Now we use it. We use it, WMAP, first data release, and measure the Hubble constant and compare it to what the Hubble key project when the Friedman and collaborators got. And you can see that the Hubble constant from WMAP in black is like spot on the value that the Hubble key project collaborators collaboration got. Everyone was happy because this means that we understand the universe very well. Even though 95% of it, we don't know what it is. Okay, it doesn't matter. We understand it to some extent. Perfect. Now let's move on. So we have WMAP data release two and data release three. And also the Hubble key project collaborations starts to improve their measurements. And by 2008, 2009, the two still agree within the errors. As I said before, now we want to go further. So we use supernovae. I explained to you before what it is the cosmic distance ladder is. So we use supernovae and very well calibrated supernovae with Cepheids and then trigonometric parallax to measure H naught as well. Okay, 2012, the Schultz collaboration another collaboration dependent from uh, uh, Wendy Friedman et al, measures the Hubble constant using supernovae calibrated uh, with Cepheids, and they obtain a value that is not so different from the Hubble key project given the uncertainties. WMAP data release, uh, this is WMAP 9, so it's nine years of taking data and analyzing it. They are okay. I would say it's uh, the CMB value is moving down, but given the uncertainties, I think everyone was pretty much okay. No need to panic. Now, uh, by 2013, then we have a very nice universe. So, what I show here is um, a space where we put a plane where we put two parameters and for each of these two plots, there are two different parameters. Each parameter tells us something about the universe. So here on the S axis, you see how much matter the universe contains. And on the Y axis, how much dark energy the universe contains in the form of a cosmological constant though. So the cosmological constant is a form of dark energy that has an energy density that doesn't change with time, which means that if we double the volume of the universe, we double the amount of dark energy in it, which is very counterintuitive because if you think about it, if I have a fixed amount of matter, if I double the volume, the density will go down by two, by a factor of two. So it's something that doesn't dilute away. It's actually growing, right? In, in absolute terms. The density though, it's constant. So that's really important. And the funny story is, that that cosmological constant is the same term that Einstein thought it was his biggest blunder. So by Einstein, even though it was wrong, it was right. And that's really unnerving to me, okay? He was right even when he was wrong. Um, so now what you want to, to do to make sure that you understand your universe very well and your model fits the data is to use independent observations and see if they tell you the same story because if they don't, something is wrong either with the data or with your model. So I told you about the supernova 1A and you see these are the region of this parameter space that is allowed by the supernovae in green. The CMB is in blue, in cyan. And this is the region of the, C, the of, of this space that is allowed by the CMB. Now this, you know, this dotted line tells us when the universe is flat in this plane. So the sum of omega matter and omega lambda, so how much matter and how much dark energy is, is always 
equal to one on this line. And that is a flat universe. So it means that if I shoot two light rays parallel, they will stay parallel forever. That's a flat universe. Now, there are other probes here, uh, cosmological probes uh, that I won't talk about, but let's say they are independent. So they know nothing about supernovae or the CMB. And as you can see, they overlap really nicely. And when you combine them, and this is in gold, you get a very tiny region of allowed parameters, which is roughly a total amount of matter is like 30% of the universe and the 70% is dark energy. And this is the story that we like. But we can also ask ourselves, but is really dark energy a cosmological constant or it's something different? And we can parameterize this difference with this parameter, it's called W, and tell us that W equals minus one is a cosmological constant. If we have smaller than minus one, dark energy is still, it's actually diluting very, very slowly, but it's diluting. If it's larger than minus one in absolute terms, dark energy is increasing. It means that the more the universe expands, the more dark energy you have, the more you have acceleration. And at some point there is so much dark energy that not even the nuclei of the atom can stay together. So there will be like a big rip. So knowing which value of W our data prefer is like telling what will be the fate of the universe, okay? So we want to know what's gonna be the fate of the universe. Perfect, so we do the same exercise. Now we put again, the how much matter and W. And we combine the data, you see that they are fairly overlapping. We combine the data and we have W of minus one is a very nice fit. And again, omega matter, the, the total amount of matter is 30%. So they tell the same story. Nice, everyone's happy. We got a standard cosmological model or what we call it a lambda cold dark matter model or lambda CDM for short. This is the standard model of cosmology up to this day. And uh, it's a universe that started at the time of the CMB with 63% dark matter, 12% in ordinary matter, 15% in photon radiation and 10% in some other particle that we call neutrinos. When it evolves in times up to the, this day, what we observe is that today, the universe is dominated 70% by dark energy, 25% or so in dark matter, and only 5% us and the stars and everything else that we can see. Now, this model of the universe rests on some assumption and on some theoretical uh, physics uh, that we think we have tested very well here on Earth and close by. For example, the standard model of particle physics has been thoroughly tested since the 1950s or so, even earlier. And we know it very, very well. So this is one of the pillars of the standard model of cosmology. Okay, and that's tell us what are the particles that we know of in the universe? What are the interactions between these particles? We have some principles, some assumptions. We think that our place in the universe is not so special, that we are just an average observer, that the universe on large enough scales is homogeneous, if we average over large scales, and is isotropic, which means wherever I look on statistically on large scales, the universe doesn't look so different. So if I look at north, it should be the same as south. Okay, this is an assumption of course, and you have to test this every single time, but it, it's working so far relatively okay. Of course, we have general relativity. General relativity is a theory of gravity ah, and we tested it very, very well, thoroughly here on earth and uh, astrophysical systems like gravitational waves, for example. We know that general relativity is amazing. It has some amazing predictions and uh, it just, you know, it, it's passing every test with a uh, flying color. So, we trust general relativity. And then we assume also that the universe is flat on globally, globally, and that the dark energy is a cosmological constant. This is what we 
have here as a base for our cosmological model. Then the only three parameters in this model are six numbers. The six numbers describe the early universe, how much matter there is, how much ordinary matter there is, and all these things, okay? It's only six numbers to describe the entire universe. I think it's a very remarkable achievement of humankind. All right, so everyone was happy until this came, all right? This came along. So ESA, the European Space Agency, decided that they also wanted a microwave the detector in the sky, so a satellite, they call it Planck. And they said, okay, look, I want to make Planck the best uh, microwave satellite, microwave telescope uh, that there is. And uh, Planck actually uh, did a great job, a very remarkable job. And uh, this is the best map of the microwave background we have nowadays. Uh, it's much, much better resolution than WMAP. And uh, you can see that the sound spectrum of the CMB now is being measured to remarkable precision down to the seventh overtone, all right? So these are the data once again, and the theoretical predictions are the green lines. And you can see that the Lambda CDM model, the standard cosmological model can fit the data just with six parameters extremely well. And again, we can measure the Hubble constant from this spectrum and we get 67.3 plus minus 1.2 kilometers per second per mesoparsec. Now you might say, well, it's not so far from the 75, 72, right? Right, but the uncertainties on these measurements got very small. And now here we have a problem, all right? So in 2013, the Planck collaboration published this paper where they showed that the Hubble constant from the CMB is actually lower than the one that we measured from supernovae and Cepheids. Uh, people were starting to fight. So the two groups were like, you are wrong. No, you are wrong. You got some systematic errors. No, you got the wrong. Okay, then you are fine and the model is wrong. Like, no, what are you talking about? Okay. So people got into big fights. And basically, they were riding up in these fights. This, this, this was actually the situation, and this is actually still up to now, the situation. So again, as I said, we started from today, and we measure the Hubble constant going farther in time, and we get one end of the bridge, but we can do the reverse and start from the CMB, and we get another end of the bridge, and then we come off way, and we see that the two matches done, done the two, the two ends don't match, and that's a big problem, right? If you were an engineer, you would say someone got it terribly wrong, right? So this is the time to panic. This is really the time to panic. And we enter here the last round, for now, of this grand debate uh, in cosmology. And the two big, the two big um, protagonists here in this story are George Staffio, one of the principal investigator and the lead scientific um, figure in the Planck collaboration. And Adam Rees, that you remember well, he won the Nobel Prize for the discovery of the cosmic acceleration. So he's the lead, uh, the, the, the main person behind the Shoes collaboration that uses supernovae to measure H0. So these two guys got publishing paper and rebuttals uh, of each other, all right? Um, now, what we really want to sort this out is to understand one of these possible, which one of these four possible scenarios we have. So we had Planck, might be wrong. Shoes might be wrong. <laughs> Both are wrong. And finally, the standard cosmological model is not the right description of the universe. So the first two, uh, if it turns out to be true, then they will be like very disappointing and boring. This, the third one, the third scenario where both are wrong, is very unlikely because they are, it, it's really unlikely to have two different measurements of the universe that are wrong in completely independent, completely different. It's possible, but unlikely. And the fact that the universe that we know of described by the cosmological, the, the Lambda CDM model uh, is not the correct description is actually the most exciting thing that we 
want. So every cosmologist really deep down wants that this happens because this way we will have a revolution again in cosmology and we will understand our universe better. Otherwise we will be stuck with 90% of the universe, 95% of the universe that we don't know, we don't understand. All right, so how do we get out of, of this impasse? Uh, we need independent observations of both the supernovae um, calibrated using the Cepheids, different probe, completely different probe of cosmology uh, of the expansion of the universe uh, with different uh, statistical analysis of the data, independent. And also we need independent teams. So we want different group of people working with different methods, even on the same data, but in different ways. So in this way, we can cross check all the problems that the data might have, and we can be absolutely sure that whatever we see, if we see something, a signal, it's really coming from the data and the model is wrong. Okay, Wendy Friedman again, at some point in, uh, during her career, decided that Cepheids were not really the right calibrator. She didn't like Cepheids anymore. <laughs> She wanted to use a different calibrator, which uh, is called the tip of the red, the red giant branch. So these are stars, again, that we think we understand their astrophysics and their evolution very well. And we know we can use them as calibrator, as distance indicator, once we calibrate them using the trigonometric parallax. So once again, we need the trigonometric parallax to calibrate this uh, TRGB stars, we call them. And then with them, we can calibrate the supernovae. So we replace the Cepheid stars with the TRGB stars. And that's what Van de Friedman uh, started to do in 2015. She measured the Hubble constant using these calibrators. Uh, the first time she was right there in the middle, but the uncertainties were big. So that it was consistent with both measurements. But by 2019, 2019, the measurement reached uh, a good enough uh, precision. And of course, as she did the first time with the Hubble Space uh, Telescope and the Hubble Key Project, the Hubble constant just falls right in the middle between Planck and uh, the Shoes Project. So it's kind of consistent with both if you want. Uh, so this doesn't really help. Uh, but again, there are big fights between Wendy Friedman and Adam Rees on who is right. Okay, because uh, she's saying basically with this data point here that the Cepheids are not good distance indicator and Adam Rees is not really, does not agree with that. So why don't we pick a different probe altogether, right? We just skip that. We don't use Cepheids, we don't use uh, supernovae. Uh, we use something else entirely. And uh, thanks to advancement in the field of cosmology, we can do that now. So we can, for example, use strong lensing time delays. So what are these, these things? So basically Einstein's theory of general relativity predicts that light should feel the influence of gravity. So if there is a very massive object and there is a light ray passing by, this will be bent by the gravitational field of this object. Now, if you have a very, very, very massive object like a massive galaxy and in the background, of this galaxy, there is another galaxy far away, okay? This galaxy can act as a lens if the position and the alignment of the background galaxy is just right along the line of sight that we see. So in fact, what we see here is a massive galaxy that is closer to us. And in the back, there is a an active galactic nuclei, so it's a quasar that is a host in a, another galaxy. And you can see that this galaxy in the background has been lensed in an Einstein ring. So this is a, the same galaxy that has been deformed by the gravitational um, field of this massive object. And the nuclei at the center of this galaxy is, this, is just uh, shown here in four different images. It's not four different objects, it's the same object that has been lensed multiple times, four times, okay? Now, another feat of this system, of this lens, strong lensing, is the fact that not only light will be bent, but 
also the time it takes light to reach us changes from image to image. So that means that if I have a variation, intrinsic variation of this uh, bright object here, bright nucleus, then this variation will happen at different times depending on the image. And if I measure the difference in time between these uh, events, this tells me something about the expansion of the universe. Because um, there is something, some cosmological information about the Hubble constant from the distance that separates us from the lens and the lens to the background galaxy that is being lensed. And there is cosmological information and from there we can extract the Hubble constant, all right? So we can use that. Or we can use the fact that the way spiral galaxy um, spin and the speed of this, uh, of the stars at the edges, you remember from Vera Rubin, is tightly correlated with the luminosity of the galaxy. And this is called the tally fisher relation. And the luminosity of these galaxies, of course, then if depends on the speed of rotation of spinning of the galaxy, tells us something about the mass, okay, of the galaxy, of the object. So if we know the rotational speed of the galaxy, we can measure it using uh, spectroscopy, for example, then we know the luminosity of the galaxy and we can use it as a distance indicator. So we can measure the upper constant from that. Or even differently, something newer is mega masers. So these are like, you can think of lasers, but in the microwave. And these are huge, humongous uh, systems uh, of, made of like water. You, you can think of water, disks, orbiting a supermassive black holes at the center of galaxies. And uh, if the conditions are just right, this disk of water will emit coherent microwave radiation. Now we know the physics of these objects really well. So we know their physical size, okay? So by knowing the physical size of this object, and we also know we can measure with our telescope, radio telescopes, their angular size, then we put them together and we can extract the distance from these objects. And we can build a Hubble diagram using mega masers and we can extract the Hubble constant from that. And the very new, the latest one is standard sirens. So using gravitational waves coming from the coalescence of two neutron stars together, we can measure the Hubble constant because we have the electromagnetic counterpart information so they emit light something that black holes don't do but neutral stars when they merge they will emit light in a burst so we know the redshift of this object we know the luminosity or in this case the loudness their standard signers we know the loudness so we can tell something about their distance we know how distant they are so we can extract again information about the Hubble constant so there are other methods now that we can use to tell who is right, okay? And that's what we found from <laughs> up to like 2020. So in the upper part, you see indirect measurements of the Hubble constant. This indirect, why? Because we assume that the cosmological models is lambda CDM model. And then we reverse engineer that up to us and say, okay, this is the Hubble constant value if we assume that lambda CDM is the correct description of the universe. These are these methods here, and they give a low value of the Hubble constant. Now, the direct measurement I talked to you about using Cepheids, the tip of the red giant branch and supernovae, the masers, the Tally Fisher, and so on, they seem to be clustering all of them around a high value of the Hubble constant. The uncertainties are larger, definitely, than this, so there is a much more scatter. But you can see that on average, these things are on the right compared to Planck. And you have to remember that all these measurements are independent. So they will suffer from different drawbacks and systematic errors in the data. So how likely is that five, six, seven different independent measurements, they all scatter to the right of the Planck, Hubble, 
constant. And if you do the math, it's very, very unlikely, very unlikely. So if people think, look, the Planck collaboration did an amazing job and we trust the Planck results. And all these measurements say, look, uh, probably something is going on because they're all independent and they scatter up. Then maybe something is wrong with the cosmology, maybe, maybe. And is there something else that actually is lurking in the shadow and uh, is actually giving us, you know, keeping us up at night? And the answer is yes, there is something else with Lon Yen. So as I said, uh, my, my, my group here, well, it's not my group, the group of my um, uh, group leader, uh, Catherine Haymans here in Edinburgh, she, they work on, on cosmic shear. So they, what is cosmic shear basically? So we can use the shape of faraway galaxies. These shape are distorted due to lensing. Again, remember Einstein's theory of general relativity predicts this. So they are distorted and rotated very ever so slightly. And then when they reach us, they have been deformed. Now, if you look at a single galaxy, it's impossible to tell if this galaxy has been distorted through gravitational lensing or if the ellipticities of these galaxies is actually its own ellipticity. Because the effect of this squashing and stretching is just a percent, a, a tiny fraction of actual ellipsi ellipticities of the, of the galaxies, right? But what we can do is average over many galaxies, millions, tens of millions, hundreds of millions, billions in the future of galaxies. And there now a pattern will emerge and will tell us that these photons coming from these galaxies have traveled through dark matter and ordinary matter. And this dark matter structure has been evolving, it's been growing, collapsing and expanding. Um, so it tells us something about how clumsy is the universe, how all clustered together is the universe. And uh, Planck can do that as well, indirectly, again, not directly, indirectly, and measure some value of its clumpiness. So this value, this parameter is S8, is the, a measure of the clumpiness of the universe. And all these surveys that measure the weak lens in cosmic shear have low value of this clumpiness parameter, which means the universe is thinner than what we expect. And all of them are independent of each other. And all of them have a low value of clumsiness. So once again, we have a tension between Planck and the late universe direct measurements of the cosmos. So maybe really something is wrong with the lambda CDM cosmology. And what can be wrong? Basically, you can think of anything within that temple I showed you before. You can modify anything to make these parameters from Planck and the late universe match again. Problem is, we didn't find any compelling theory that can fix everything at the same time in a very simple and satisfactory way. So why we now really are struggling and we are asking theorists to come up with something, something good. All right, so at the moment, this is the situation. We have these two teams are much, much bigger than that. And to get out of this, we will need much more data. And uh, in the 2020s, this decade will be, we will be flooded with data from many, many different uh, telescopes, observatories, from all the entire electromagnetic spectrum, going from the radio to the X-ray. But with great power comes great responsibility. So we have all this data, but we have to make sure we understand this data that we don't screw it up by adding something artificially, or we have some problems with the data. We have to make absolutely sure that we understand the data. And the way we do that is uh, what I told you before, having independent analysis teams and so on. And also if we want to change the foundation of cosmology as they are now, Carl Sagan told us extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. So we have to see in the data this very, very clearly. So we have accuracy. We want our 
analysis and data to be accurate, we want them to be precise. The two don't go hand in hand, uh, right? So you can be precise and inaccurate and vice versa. So we want both accuracy and precision for the future. And only then at that point, the bridge will match and we'll have a fabulous theory of the universe. Thank you for your attention. Matthew, thank you so much. Um, it's such a, I don't know, I, I, I think it's an exciting story. It sounds a bit alarming. I'm not sure whether all the people working in it are um, just got bad headaches or are quite enthusiastic or a bit of both maybe some days. Um, what does strike me is that in order to move this on, you've come up with a whole range of new probes and new ways in, but that takes funding. And is this something that is well-funded or um, are they gonna struggle? Um, I say most of these observatory and satellites and uh, telescopes, they have been funded. Yeah. So the, most of them are in the constructions actually. So Euclid um, is almost ready to be launched. So it should be launched this year, hopefully. DESI is an observatory in, the, in Arizona. Uh, it's ground-based, so it's cheaper. And it's actually in operation right now, so it's taking data. Uh, the Rubin Observatory is under construction in Chile. The Roman Observatory, again, is under construction. JWST, maybe you know it. They are close, they are close. Uh, Erosita has been launched and it's taking data. So it's out there uh, in L2 uh, taking data of the uh, X-ray universe. Uh, CMBS4 uh, as well, it will happen. Uh, so there is a, there are big teams, big collaboration, big money. The, the problem is you're going to need a, a lot of um, posts, aren't you? Because this lot's going to deluge you with data. Oh uh, yes, definitely, definitely. Mm. Um, it, it's really a challenge. Um, actually, it, data management is a challenge in and on itself here. So it's so much data yeah. that we have yeah, to yeah. come up with new ideas, how to store it, how to query it. It's yeah. really, really fun. So do the contestants um, work together? I mean, can they collaborate or are they just um, in completely separate holes fighting each other? Well, the, the thing is that... Um, there should be some collaboration, definitely, but good, healthy competition should be there as well for the reason I told you about. Yeah. So if you have independent <laughs> methods, independent thinking, and you converge on the same results as the, for dark energy, so the acceleration, right? You converge on the same, you can be confident that that result is correct. If you start influencing each other methods, I think it's getting, like, we, we get in trouble. On top of that, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah that different collaboration evolves. So people working on one collaboration at some point, they might go to the other collaboration in the yeah. future. So there is a crossbreeding, okay. there's crossbreeding. Okay, that sounds healthy, that's good, yeah, yeah, yeah. David's still muted. Sorry, I was typing um, on the YouTube chat channel there just in the... <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, there's lots, lots of... Lots of uh, comments on the YouTube channel saying thank you very much for a fascinating talk and uh, thank you. there's a lot of obviously a lot of uh, conflict still going on in the in the cosmology um, community um, we've got a, a few questions one of the uh, ones is of the numerous independent studies mentioned how many are based on the same data for example, Hubble or Gaia? Right, that's a very good question. Mm. So, for example, here, uh, I told you about how you need distance ladder um, calibrators, right? So, up to this point, basically, um, these different teams were using the same trigonometric parallaxes from Hubble, right? And Gaia later on. 
So the SHU's team is starting to use Gaia data. They are not, uh, this is the Carnegie Chicago Hubble program, something like that. They haven't used um, the Gaia data yet, but they've been using Hubble. On top of that, they're using the same supernovae. So they only changed the intermediate calibrate, the intermediate rung of the ladder. They replaced cephades using PRGB stars. So in this case, for example, there is some cross overlapping between the two. Um, so yeah. So one has to be careful. <laughs> yeah, so that, that could mean that uh, the studies that are using the same data are going to get similar results. Part, part of it, yeah. Yeah. Um, another question is, um, could you explain what the term multiple moment is? Ah, yes, sure. <laughs> All right. So multiple moments are these numbers. Basically, they are an alternative way of thinking about angles. So a each L here is given by, let me think, uh, it should be the 180 degrees, is that right? Divided by the angle I observe. So the angular scale I observe. So if I add a multiple moment of one, it means 180 divided by 180. So I'm looking at half of the sky and half of the sky. Of two, it's a quarter of the sky and so on. Oh, and so basically, yeah. yeah, so basically you are looking at different resolutions as you move up in multiples and smaller angles. So you look at structures as smaller and smaller structures on the sky. Right. Right, I think, yeah, I think that probably gives a good explanation of it. Um, just having a quick scan through the, uh, the thing. Uh, yeah, lots of, uh, lots of complimentary comments about how interesting the talk is. Um, I do have a question myself, is that um, I recall from a few years ago that there was some debate about supernova or the particularly the, the type 1A supernovas, that there was some serious doubts about the calibration of them as standard candles. Has that been resolved? I would say largely so. Uh, there are still, I mean, you have to think that each claim is always under thorough scrutiny every single time. So there are, of course, groups around the world that are checking this statement that mm. supernova type 1a are good calibrators. And they're trying to see if the data we have right now have some trends. And these trends, of course, can in, like propagate systematic errors in, in, uh, in our analysis. And then we can infer from them something wrong. Uh, so far, largely, I think the community agrees that the calibration is OK, is OK. So one thing you might. Um, doubt is, look, I'm calibrating the supernova type 1a in the local universe using cephates, right, close by. And then I'm using type 1a supernovae to tell me about the distant universe. But are they really the same type 1a supernovae? So, for example, the question is, do they evolve in time, these kind of objects? Is there like a dependence on metallicity, for example, or something else? And so far, I think no one managed to give a convincing uh, yes. So there is like something wrong with the supernova. Yeah, okay. That's great. I think um, right, there's no, no other questions on the, on the chat at the moment. So uh, I, went, I went a bit over time, <laughs> I realized. <laughs> no, that's okay. It was fascinating stuff. I mean, it, it, cosmology is, is such an evolving subject and it, it's a, a new topic, as you say, it, it only really started sort of in the early 20th century as a, as a, as a science. Yeah. So, so. We, were, we were not taken seriously at the time. It was like, uh, it was not even considered a science, right? Yeah. Also in, in cosmology more than other fields, it seems that each um, sort of big step 
is built on and leans quite heavily on where how well the last lot was resolved and you tend to think that there's the possibility of a growing problem um, embedded in this that is just making its way up through the pyramid. Yeah, yeah. Um, so you, you're, worried, you're be, worried that we are building our understanding of the universe on uh, like a house of cards or something like that. Well, I, I wouldn't have liked to use the house of card analogy myself, but um, it would be a quite scary thing to disentangle if that was the case because obviously if there's the problems further down the pyramid then there's a bit of an issue at the top um no you're you're absolutely correct and you're absolutely correct and in fact there's always a faction of people the dissidents in the cosmology community <laughs> the dissidents are really a pain in the back but they are useful because they question every single step, as you said, every single time. So whenever someone makes a claim, they said, have you really checked correctly? Let me recheck it. Let me recheck it again. Yeah. And then they enjoy uh, their role though. Yeah, I think it's important in all sciences to have, um, you know, some healthy skepticism, I think is the word. You want, you want to make sure that the, the results you're getting are valid and that they, they do fit into what the universe is telling you because I think it was Feynman said when you have any kind of dispute the universe is right. <laughs> Absolutely the universe is much smarter than we are. Yeah. Um, <laughs> no, 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 totally totally and uh, I, I think the most uncomfortable um, aspect of this, of this model we have of the universe as I said repeatedly is that 95 percent of it we don't understand. Yeah. And, that, and that's a real problem. So it's a, a phenomenological model. So we have some properties of the stuff in it. It seems to fit the data nicely, different kind of data, but we don't understand it. And that's what makes us uncomfortable. Mm. It's right? also so, a nice challenge to have though. It, it's an incredible challenge. So for example, lots of particle physicists, you know, like the CERN itself, they wanted to discover dark matter, right? They had candidates, but nothing turned up, nothing at all. So there is a, in part, a crisis in particle physics, and on the other hand, a crisis in cosmology. Mm -hmm. Who knows if these two crises actually are the same crisis, right? It would seem though that not being secure on, um, I mean, sometimes not even too close to secure on things like the age of the universe is a pretty, um, almost dangerous concept to have that far out because, I mean, some of these error bars are pretty big. <laughs> well, okay, let me see. So the age of the year is nowadays. So this is a uh, uh, Hubble constant. Uh, they are far by like 8%. So we know the age of the universe within 8%, which I think is a pretty good estimate given that originally we thought the universe was 3 billion years old or even less. <laughs> So I think it's about like say 14 billion years old or 13.8, 13.7 years old. So it, it's, it's all right, but really the, the core, the issue here is the fact that this uh, tension, this crisis might tell us something more uh, about the universe that we don't know. And yeah. that's what we want to understand. But we have to make sure that the data, the data fly. We, we, we grant you've made progress, you know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I think it's astonishing that in only, only 100 years, we went from yeah, yeah. the galaxy to we understand the cosmos at that yeah. level. So I think yeah. it's very, very more. It is tremendous. It absolutely is. Will you be able to maintain this work in your new post or? Definitely, definitely, yes. Yeah, yeah. I've got, I've got yeah. other three years for now uh, where I can work on, on these issues. And maybe within, actually, I, I didn't have the time to mention, but I think this will be resolved in a way or another within the next five to 10 years. So the, okay. the, the 2020s are really the decades where we can tell something about the cosmos because of yeah. these observatories and this much data. Yeah. So it's, uh, it's really, we will know the universe at the level 
that's very intimate, <laughs> very, very intimate. So nothing, nothing, almost nothing can uh, escape from this data. But, but will we know what dark matter is? <laughs> Uh, that's, uh, it's a possibility. It's a possibility. If we measure something that some theories of dark matter tell us, oh, yeah. and then we measure it, and I think it would be great. You know, it could be even that uh, some modification to Einstein's theory of general relativity might be the answer to dark matter. But again, you have a theory, you give me a prediction, let me check if I see that in the data, if it fits the data very well. Well, exciting times, exciting oh, yeah. times in cosmology without a doubt. Um, yeah. Kind of nice to be around at the time of one of the big questions coming along like that. That's, that's really good. Yeah, that's I'm really lucky. good. I'm lucky. <laughs> well, I think I think so. <laughs> Matteo, thank you ever so much for um, so much. putting together this, which is no mean feat in itself, and um, coming along and talking to us. That's really excellent. No, thank you so much. Hopefully thank sometime you we'll, we'll see you up at the mills maybe sometime then. Definitely. I hope I can come back in, uh, you know, five, ten years time and uh, tell yes. you that we understand the universe much better than we built a very solid bridge, not a house of cards. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. absolutely, yeah. yeah. Thank you ever so much. Okay, absolutely.